up, we have an amazing speaker, uh, Ben, Senior Developer Advocate at Auth0. And he will be sharing an, a very interesting presentation, hacking J J JWTs and how to stop it. So just like me, I think you are also eager to hear from Ben. And uh, just like this session, uh, we will have 20 minutes for the presentation and we'll take reserve the last five minutes for any of the questions you might have from Ben. So Ben, a very warm welcome to you at API Days Live Singapore. Thanks, Deeraj. It's really good to be here. Thanks for the, the introduction. Um, I will try and keep it to within 20 minutes. This talk usually takes a little longer, but we'll get through it. We'll have Q&A. Um, and I'm also really happy that AuthZero is sponsoring. So we've got, if we've got more questions after that, we can always head over to the booth and, and chat more. Um, but thanks, Deeraj. I'll, uh, I'll get started. So my name is Ben Dekroy. Um, as you've heard, I am a developer advocate for AuthZero. Um, but for, I'd like to give you a bit more of an introduction just to help you understand why I'm here and why why me? Why, why me talking to you about hacking JSON web tokens? So my background is in software development. I've been doing it for actually 22 years now. Um, I've just rolled over my my development anniversary recently. And for a lot of that, it's it's been a heavy focus on security and privacy. Um, advocacy, talking about it at conferences. I've run conferences. So that whole privacy advocacy and just loving connecting with the community, meeting people like you, finding out the challenges you're facing, um, eventually led to me uh, meeting a developer advocate who worked at All Zero, who said, you should come join us. So I did, and here I am today. Um, so I, I've got the development background, and I've got a lot of passion about security and privacy. Uh, I love to break things as well. Um, some of the, the best ways for us to learn is to see how things fail and how we can then do better. So let's do that today. Let's see how JSON Web, to JSON Web Tokens can fail. So I'm going to just briefly skip through, um, uh, touch on how uh, tokens come about, where they come from, um, why it works for identity and authentication. Uh, so essentially, you've got your user on the left here. You've got your uh, your server or your resource server that you're trying to get information from, and then you've got the identity server. So the resource server is the one on the, the top right there, and the identity server down on the bottom right. And generally, through the magic of the internet, a whole lot of data flow happens. We won't go into that in this talk. Um, I can talk to you about that in the booth if you want to know more about the auth flows. But a request goes to the request so, uh, the resource server. The resource server says, hey, you need to log in, redirects you to the identity server. Identity server logs you in, sends a code in some way back to the resource server. And the resource server, you can see the, the third line, uh, the, the fifth line there on the right-hand side. The resource server can use this code to make a request to the identity server and say, hey, give me some tokens so I know something about the person who just logged in. And that's essentially closing that security gap. Uh, the, the loop and making sure that the, the tokens come directly from the identity server back to the resource server. Resource server now has these tokens it can work with. Predominantly, there are two main uh, tokens, the identity token and the access token, the first two you can see there. There's also a refresh token, which isn't available in all situations. Um, it, it's basically used if the access token is expired and in some way a system needs to request a new access token without user intervention. Um, but the first two, the, the identity token and the access token, are the JSON web tokens. Access tokens can also not be JSON web tokens, but we won't worry about that for the purposes of this talk. So this is where the to tokens come into play. Um, th they're generally used for um, passing around one or more claims or, or assertions. So an ID token would have a claim that my name is Ben. Uh, it would also be something that can be, uh, that there's some kind of detection processing for tampering. So when your application or your API receives uh, an access token, for example, your, your system can verify that the token hasn't been tampered with without having to go back to the identity server. Uh, it's got a, it's got a, a mechanism for, for self-validation, essentially. And like I say, the ID token is useful for identity and the access token for an authorized set of permissions. So you could think of them like a government-issued ID and a permission slip to allow you to do something on somebody else's behalf. All right, that's, uh, that's that kind of really quick overview of where they come from. Let's dive into a JSON Web Token so that we can understand how it's composed and how we can break it. So a JSON Web Token is composed, composed of three, uh, three parts. Um, that's not necessarily always true. Like an encrypted web, JSON Web Token has multiple extra parts for the encryption side of things. But by and large, your, your generic standard JSON Web Token will have a header, a payload, and a signature. Now, the header and the payload, if your brain was able to URL base64 decode uh, those the, the yellow and the pinkish uh, text there, you would notice that they are actually JSON. Uh, so they're not encrypted, they're not protected in any way. A system can decode those, turn them into JSON, machine readable, human readable, 
my, my point is don't put secrets in here. Don't put things in there that should never be leaked. Um, assume that this is um, being passed around and in some way could get leaked. The signature is a, a hash, basically, of the header and the payload. Uh, we'll have a look into how these are created. It's important to know how it's created so we can know how to destroy them. So if you, uh, if, if you do have one of those brains that can basic, uh, URL base64 decode, uh, you will have noticed from the previous slide that the token we're looking at has a HS256 algorithm. So that's an HMAC SHA-256, which is a symmetric hashing algorithm. We'll look more at algorithms in a second. And the type of the token is JWT. Um, we don't need to delve into how that can be extended. The idea of defining in a JSON web token that it is a JSON web token is there's a scope for extending that. So we could define in there in the future, for example, this is a, a, an ID token specifically or an access token um, rather than the end system having to determine what kind of token it is. Um, but by and large, most of them you see will just say type is JWT. If we look at the payload, this is where things get a bit more exciting. If we decode the payload we had a few slides ago. We get a SUB. So this is a standard uh, in, in JSON web token parlance for a subject. And this is the unchanging identity of the user who just logged in. So every time somebody logs in through an identity provider such as Auth0, you're going to get an ID token back, and you'll have a subject in there. And that string will always be the same. So now in your application, whereas before you had a username and password stored, you now also you, you only need to store that subject. And next time you need to resurface that user um, because, I don't know, you've got an internet banking site and you need to know which accounts they are. So you need a user representation still. You load by that subject rather than the username and password. The identity surface, uh, the identity provider can also have extra bits of information like the name. Um, sometimes you have email addresses, photos, other kind of things in there. And then there's other fairly standard type uh, claims as well. IAT is issued at, EXP is expired. And these are like seconds since epoch timestamps of when the token was issued, when it expires, and um, various other things. So this was this is what the payload looks like. Now, if we take the payload and the header, and we bis 64 year old encode both, them both, join them together with a full stop, and then we run them through an HMAC SHA-256 hashing algorithm, which requires a pre-shared key, uh, that pre-shared key needs to exist on the identity server in order to create the, the token, and also on all of the the token, all, all of the systems that rely on that token, so your API endpoints, your applications that are reading the identity token, um, the relying parties, essentially, they also need to know that pre-shared key so that they can recreate the, uh, the signature in order to verify that the signature in the token they received matches the signature they would expect. And that's what allows them to, to determine whether or not the content, either the header or the payload, has been tampered with. The other option, uh, and there are a number of different algorithms, um, but the other one is, uh, 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 the other common one is R RSA um, SHA-256 or RS-256 is, as, a, as an abbreviation. And this takes a private key instead of a secret. So in this case, because the identity server needs to create them, it'll have the private key. And then the public key, which is also on the identity server, can also be passed to all the applications. And there's actually a convenient way of getting that from most identity servers, which we'll look at in a second. So we have these uh, symmetric key signing, uh, key hashing uh, algorithms and asymmetric key hashing algorithms, which, which have their pros and cons. Symmetric is faster. Uh, asymmetric is arguably more secure because the secret, the private key never leaves the identity server. And that's an important thing to, to note as well, these two different types of, of hashing. All right. Uh, Let's have a look at what the four main types of hacking are that I want to do today. Um, we have about 12 minutes left, so I think we're doing well. Uh, I'm not going to describe what they all are uh, from this slide. Let's just jump straight into Oopsie, and we'll have a look at the, the first example of how JSON Web Tokens can be abused, hacked, misused. Uh, this is basically surrounding the idea that the signature might not be checked. So remember I said that the way of self-validating or the way a system can validate uh, the, the token that's received is by looking at the signature, recreating the signature, or in the case of a, a symmetric hashing algorithm, or in the case of an um, asymmetric hashing algorithm, using the public key to verify that the signature is valid and created with the, the corresponding private key. Um, sometimes they're not checked. This could be oversight. It could be that you're coding away, you're, you've written your JWT handling uh, code, and you've just forgotten to. Uh, ideally, this would not be the situation. Most of us are going to be looking at the specs and saying, well, we need to verify the signature. That's fine. Um, the other thing is it could be a bug. And this might happen a lot more than you might think. So I did a search on GitHub for JWT signature not checked, with a not checked in quotes. And there are 145 issues. And the first one on the list was an open web application security project repository. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that there are bugs in all of the 145 issues here. I'm just suggesting that there are enough issues happening that these kind of bugs are being reported at the very least. Um, I don't know which one of these are actual bugs, which of them are uh, not bugs, but somebody just got something wrong. I don't know. The other thing I also don't know is how many search results there are for JWT signature ignored or JWT signature invalid or all these other kinds of search. So my point here is that there are a lot of reports of signature um, mishandling or even lack of handling. We, we need to bear in mind that it is possible for organizations of all sizes and developers of all skills to get these things wrong every now and then. So I'm just going to take a, a drink of water, and I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to have a look at this code and see if you can work out um, why this is going to never check the, the token, uh, the signature. Also a chance to catch my breath again. I talk extremely quickly, so I hope I'm, I hope I'm not going too fast. Um, please do mention something in the comments. So I have them over here so I can see them. So the issue with this code is essentially that we go through, let me get my mouse in here. So we go through the start here and we split the token up into parts and then we recreate the signature. So we take part zero, the header, and part one, the, the payload. We know what the secret is because it's our application. This is fine. We regenerate the signature. And what we want to do now is make sure the signature we just generated is the same as the one in the token. So we, we compare the two down here, except the astute of you will have noticed that this is not a comparison. This is actually an assignment. We're saying the signature in the token is now equal to the signature that we checked. It should have been a double equals or perhaps a triple equals depending on your language of choice. And essentially this will always, this will actually do the assignment but it'll also, also resolve as true. So we're now returning the payload. Uh, we've never actually checked the signature. We basically generated a signature and then just returned the payload. So these things happen. Bug number two, we're still experimenting with things. So in this case, uh, we might be doing stuff in development, um, trying to do some testing, and some of these capabilities accidentally go through into production. So I mentioned before uh, HS256, RS256, there are various hashing algorithms. And if you look at jwt.me, um, I'll show you that later on in the demo. It's a website written by a colleague of mine, and it's got a, a way of testing or, or looking into what's inside a JSON web token. But there's also a long list at the bottom of all the SDKs for most of the most common languages and frameworks that will do JWT management for you. And one of the key outcomes of this talk is to suggest to use one of those rather than write your own. But in that table of all of the, the SDKs, there's a list of compatibility with the different algorithm types, and these 14 are the ones that it compares against. So they're pre predominantly, I'm not going to say this is the exclusive list of, of all of the ones that are used in production, um, but they are the predominant ones. But there is a 15th one. It's not necessarily undocumented. It's just never known about because we don't generally use it unless we're doing something in development or testing where we find out about this because of the fact that we need it, and that's the algorithm none which essentially means you don't even need a signature. It's not that there's no hashing and we just concatenate the whole thing in. We just It's just blank. And sometimes this gets through into production. So that, I, I don't think I need to explain to you why that's an issue. We can essentially just say, okay, well, here's a token. Uh, there's no signature. Just accept it as gospel truth. Um, so in the example before, we've got the decoded header and payloads here. That's what we saw in the first um, token, and we've got our signature down at the bottom. If I came in and wanted to say, well, I'm now an administrator, I admin is true, the signature is not going to be valid. But if I change the algorithm to none and remove the signature altogether, resulting in a JSON web token that looks like this, this is now a valid JSON web token that says that my name is Ben and I'm an administrator. So if your endpoint accepts this, then you're in trouble. Uh, so one a uh, key thing out of this particular bug to remember is that the, the header is actually, in fact, the whole JSON web token is user generated or should be treated as user supplied uh, data. So in if you write a front end application that has a form and you submit that, you're going to do validation on that data. You need to do validation on the JSON web token as well. All right, breaking the key. So this is the pre-shared key example where you have the like the HS256, where you have the key shared amongst all the different systems. So in this kind of situation, pre-shared key is exactly like a password. And we all know that passwords are bad. There are better ways of securing our own user accounts than passwords. Uh, they can get leaked, they can get guessed, and they can get brute forced. The interesting thing with JSON Web Tokens is, and you'll remember that, and you probably already know, that these can be tested for validity in an offline space. You don't need to check with any central provider to see whether or not um, the, the JSON Web Token is valid. So what I can actually do is 
do an offline process where I brute force the JSON web token by trying to create all of these signatures until one matches, and then I know which which pre shared key was used, and now I can generate any any token that I want. So that, that's a really easy one to do offline. Uh, it can't be detected until it's actually in use. So pre-shared keys obviously um, have a, a bit of a disadvantage here. They are fine to use if you're in full control of your ecosystem, and it's very unlikely that the tokens are going to leave that ecosystem or the keys are going to leave that ecosystem. As soon as you've got a third-party vendor who wants to use your, your tokens, that's where you want to really start thinking about going across to asymmetric uh, hashing algorithms. Um, the downside to asymmetric hashing algorithms and why you might consider still using the symmetric uh, HMAC, for example, uh, hashing algorithms is because they're going to take slightly longer to process. Um, they're more CPU intensive because they're pub doing public private key um, work rather than just hashing with, with a secret. All right, the fourth one, and we will get into the demo in a second, is where you get tricked. So this is essentially like an algorithm downgrade attack. It's technically not. A downgrade attack is generally where you will try and use an algorithm that you know there's a vulnerability in. What we're going to do here, though, is we're going to assume that HMAC is a downgrade from RSA hashing. So symmetric is less um, less safe than, than asymmetric for the reasons we just spoke about. But we'll actually use that as an attack vector on the token. So let's consider that you've got a number of different applications you're working on, and you want to consolidate a lot of this code. So you create a shared li library that will decode a token. And you pass into it the token and the key. In order to decode it, you need to know what kind of token it is. So you look in the header of the token, and you look at the type. And the type will say, um, actually, that should be algorithm. Um, you look at the algorithm, and the algorithm will be RS-256 or HS-256. If it's RS-256, then we'll use the RS-256 decode function. Otherwise, we'll use the HS-256 decode function. Meanwhile, we've got a JSON web token, and we know this needs to be a more secure one. So we've chosen to use RS-256 in this case, and we've got uh, the, the payload in there, and there's a signature generated somewhere. And then we've got our business logic. So this is the one instance where we're going to be using this. Again, we know we're using RS-256. So we use this uh, mechanism that I was mentioning before. There's a, a way of getting the, the public key from most identity providers. There's well-known URL here. And by, by hitting this URL, you're going to get the, the public key back. We can then pass that key and the token into the decode function. And the decode function is now going to run the RS-256 case and run the RS-256 decode function, passing the token and the public key in. So we can come back, do the verification, come back with the, the payload. Now, let's say I go in and say, well, I actually want to make myself an admin. So I'm going to change it to admin and then change the algorithm to HS-256. In this case, what happens is the function is now going to call the HS-256 decode uh, method instead of the the RS-256 decode because it's looking at the header and it's trusting what's in that JSON web token. So it's going to now pass in the token, which is the token it received, and the key, which if you remember is actually this part down here, the, the um, public key for the RS-256 hashing algorithm, but it's going to pass that in purportedly as the pre-shared key for the HMAC hashing algorithm. So this is obviously not ideal. Right, so I wanted to go over that in more of a structured slideshow because um, once we start delving into the code, I want you to have an idea of what's going on in the background. So I have this tool that I've written over here, um, and I'm happy to share the, the, the GitHub repository for this for you to play with if you want. Uh, and what I want to do is also show you some code. So essentially, this tool here, um, we've got an area where we can put in a JSON web token. It'll break it down into three components. If it's an HS-256 algorithm, we also get the ability to regenerate our own uh, signature down here. We can submit a request to a backend server and get a response. And basically, what happens when I hit that Submit button here is in this React application, we're running this bit of code. So essentially, we're just making a call to an API backend, and we're passing in the JSON web token as a, a bearer uh, authentication token. So that's, that's the only really important part of the front end. The front end doesn't change from this point in. When we call this request endpoint, um, so this is the, the function of the backend, I've got four um, actual request handlers that I've written. And we're basically going to use the first one. The first one is a regular request handler, does exactly what we expected to do. So as you can see, when we ran it over here, we submitted uh, this information. We know that the pre-shared key is secret. If I change the, uh, click this, that doesn't change. If I change this to secret two, then this gets updated. You probably don't, that went, got updated there as well. Hit submit request, and now we get a, an invalid signature error. Um, if I remove this altogether, uh, oops, wrong button then we're going to get a, a JWT signature is required. So this is the way the JSON web tokens should work. Now, let's say, for example, we got the uh, one of the first errors wrong, and we're not actually checking the signature. So 
I've just changed that and I've saved. So now if I hit submit he here, we're still um, going to get the, the admin is false because I haven't managed to do that here. And the goal here is to log in as admin. Um, so I need to change this to admin, but we're getting a status 200, even though the signature that got passed in is empty. Um, so let's come in here now and we'll add in admin. Actually, no, the way you hack this one is you just change your username to admin. So now here we can see admin is true and I haven't needed to generate the signature. Um, now, in this case, the bug is so bad, you don't even need to change this to none. Um, but in other instances, you would change that to none, and then it would definitely accept the fact that the signature wasn't uh, wasn't provided. So demo of, of the first case. Uh, second case is where we allow none. Actually, no, I've, I got ahead of myself. So this is, uh, the first one was correct. It's where we uh, allow signature, uh, we ignore the signature. Now we're going to allow none. So let me just change this back to uh, HS256. Um, and we're changing it to admin, and we have no signature here. If I send this request now, um, did I hit save? <laughs> I didn't uncopy this one, uncomment this one. So if I submit the request now, we're going to get, what's happened? Okay, let me just refresh this page so we get back to this point here. Okay, you submit the request, and we've got the, the 200 coming back. Now what we want to do is we want to attack it with a none. So if we change the algorithm to none, and we remove the the signature altogether. Um, notice that it ends in a dot there. We actually don't have a signature at all. Submit the request, and we still get the status 200. So in this case, as you notice, when I changed it back to HS256, it didn't work. Um, but with it algorithm specified as none, we can now bypass signature checking still. Um, so that's one of those cases where you've got uh, a feature that was designed for, for testing. I don't want to have to generate a, a signature for every token in a testing environment, especially when I'm going through a complex test suite. So I'll use algorithm none, and that's accidentally made it through to production. Uh, so those two are fairly straightforward. You can kind of imagine what the code looks like in the background. Um, this final one here, requesting the trusted algorithm. So I've got this code down here. I've got a public key um, that would normally be checking against in this code. I won't go through exactly what's happening here. I mean, you can see that we're, we're splitting out the token and we're regenerating the signature. Um, but essentially what this is going to do is pass through the the token, the, the signature um, and verify it as an RS-256. Now, it's a little bit trickier to do this um, just by typing because um, public-private keys are a bit more complicated. So I'm just going to jump into the tips section over here. And again, I'm going to make this application online so anybody can use it. I'll share the, the, token, the, the URL with you uh, if you jump over to the All Zero channel afterwards. Um, so what I'm going to do, and I'm cognizant of the fact that we're, we are running a little low on time, is I'll just take the public key here, and we're going to jump back into the demo zone, and we're going to paste it in here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change uh, actually, now let's do this a different way. Let's jump in and grab a valid token. So this is the valid token. So now we've got the RS-256, and we've got the token down here, the signature down here based on asynchronous. I'm going to change this to HS-256 now, so we get the ability to generate our signature. But again, I'm now going to copy this public key. I'm going to use this public key as a pre-shared key. So I'll paste that in there, regenerate the signature. It gets a lot shorter, because this is now an HMAC uh, signature. But theoretically, I, I shouldn't have been able to regenerate the signature. I shouldn't have known what the key is. But because I'm using the public key, I can now submit the request, is admin is false. But if I change that to admin and regenerate the signature, now we've got admin is true. And I've managed to bypass a system um, that was supposed to be more secure. So. Um, in essence, the outcome of this is basically don't reinvent the wheel. Um, use those proven li libraries that are available in JWT.io. Um, so this is the application that a friend of mine wrote. And like I say, there's a whole load of library references down here of how you can make your application more secure. So don't reinvent the wheel because writing your own security is hard. Writing your own crypto is hard. Um, contribute back if you do need to make changes to open source software. Um, but other than that, thank you for your time. Um, I realize we're very close <laughs> to the end now. Um, but like I say as well, we're at the booth, so you can come and ask me questions uh, if, if you do have any. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ben. And I think it was a terrific presentation. And I'm sure many of the audiences have taken a lot of screenshots. And many of the <laughs> questions or queries would be coming back to you later on as well. So I'm thanks sure. again for an My DMs are open as well. So my, my handle is this one here, at Ben Decroy. So feel free to DM me on Twitter. Um, or email me, benedecorai.com works as well. Awesome. Thanks again, Ben. That's right. If I just want to say one thing, 
um, about the t-shirt competition. Sure. Not that I'm trying to plug it, but just to say that I'll be giving uh, away t-shirts just to the first 10 people, just because I don't have enough money to give one to everyone. Um, but if they did fill out this form, which is basically a feedback form, um, the first 10 people will get a t-shirt. I just wanted to put that limit in there so that people weren't disappointed. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Ben. Thanks, Yash.